Okay, to start the afternoon's festivities. Um, first off, uh, each of the speakers um, on either side are gonna be given a five minute opening um, spiel. All right, introduction, introduction time and to state their case. Each team will then be given a seven minute rebuttal. Okay, and each team then has two minutes to close. And since uh, we have the away team here, the guests, they get to choose who goes first. Okay, so they're gonna go first, one speaker will go, then we'll switch to this side and then go back. And then there will be the question phase, but I can explain that when we get there. All right, and I'll let each speaker introduce themselves. Okay. Why don't you come up to the podium for this? Come, come up to the podium? Yeah. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, my name's Martin Monticell. I'm a student at uh, Assemblies of God Theological Seminary, which is just right down the road. Religion must die for mankind to live. This quote comes from Bill Maher's concluding soliloquy to his film, Religulous. I would fully agree with Maher, but not in the way that he intended. In a published series of sermons entitled The Word of God and the Word of Man, 20th century theologian Karl Barth writes, religious arrogance permits itself simply everything. Experience becomes its own enjoyment, its own sufficiency, its own end. In Bart, Mar finds an unlikely partner in the battle against religion. Bart rails against the small-minded religious pursuits of humanity while maintaining a belief in the God who is above all religion. What we must recognize is that the failures of religion are no more a disproof of God's existence than the failures of government officials are a disproof of the principles upon which a country like America was founded. Can we disprove the goodness of the principle simply by looking at the failures of those who represent this principle? I would strongly argue that we cannot. The failures of those in religious power, including sex scandals, ignorance, disgusting lack of humility, gross justification of war and violence, deceitfulness of those who extort money, these do not prove, prove or disprove the existence of God. They simply prove that humanity is bent toward destroying itself. We only need look around to determine this. Is theism the cause of this? Well, there's no doubt that religion has often participated in this self-destruction. However, the thesis that theism is somehow behind all the violence of this world is false and a gross generalization. If we are intellectually honest, we'll realize that all of us are religious, whether or not we are theists. Religion is, after all, not necessarily associated with theism, but is rather the beliefs, attitudes, emotions, behavior that constitute a man's relationship with the power and principles of this universe. I think of the cult of reason established after the de-Christianization of France during the French Revolution. I think of Joseph Stalin and the religion of communism. He was one of the bloodiest despots in modern history, terrorizing and killing millions of people. Perhaps religion in the sense of extreme ideology and a twisted, disgusting view of the world is the cause of most of the violence in this world. But one should never make the error of equating religion and theism. The belief in God does not cause violence, rather the self-destructive bent of humanity causes violence. So if we were able to move past our critiques of religion, moving past Feuerbach's assessment that the question of God is nothing more than a question of anthropology, then we might be able to deal with some of the tough philosophical issues that get a, really get at the heart of this matter. For example, I'll, I'll go at two of them, foundation of morality and the human transcendence of biological processes. The question, can we be good without God? Let me be clear here, this isn't the same question as can we be good without a belief in God? Often, the, often those who do not believe in God put those who do to shame. But this is not a question of belief, this is a question of God's existence. William Lane Craig writes, if God exists, then the objectivity of moral values, moral duties, and moral accountability is secured. In the absence of God, that is, if God does not exist, then morality is just a human convention. That is to say, morality is wholly subjective and non-binding. We might act in precisely the same ways that we do, in fact, act. But in the absence of God, such, such actions would no longer count as good or evil, since if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. End quote. We make judgments based upon right and wrong every day. We do this independently of whether or not anybody believes it to be so. This, this is to say that the Crusades were morally wrong, even though the Christians doing this thought it was God's will. This is to say that the Holocaust was wrong, even though Nazis thought this was something that they should be doing. The naturalist argument does not compute here. 
if we are just a biological organism, then morality is culturally relative and no, one does not have a right to say that any particular action is wrong any more than they have a right to say two plus two equals five. Reason doesn't decide here. Pure practical reason, even with good knowledge of the facts, will not take you to morality. In conclusion, I want to offer some reflections on faith. Mars states in his film, the only appropriate attitude for man to have about the big questions is doubt. I would fully agree, but I would take that conclusion further by proposing that faith is the logical conclusion of doubt. Everyone has faith in something, whether it be in themselves or in a higher power. Paul Tillich defines faith as the act of being ultimately concerned, which means that doubt is a necessary, necessary element in it. It is a consequence of the risk of faith. A scientist who states that a scientific theory is beyond doubt would at that moment be, cease to be scientific. Serious doubt is confirmation of faith. Thank you. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ben, and I'm an atheist blogger on Zanga. And I'm delighted to be able to speak with you this afternoon. I recognize I happen to hold a minority opinion on the matter of the topic of does God exist? And that sometimes being critical of the existence of God comes off as unnecessarily antagonistic. Many believers think they have a personal relationship with God. So when I question his existence, I might as well be barging into someone's home and demanding that they divorce their spouse because he or she is a non-existent whore who sleeps around with any logical fallacy and lack of evidence. I understand that kind of theme comes off as unnecessarily abrasive, but we do have some rather contrasting opinions to sort out somehow. In a debate between Jewish, Jewish theist David Wolpe and atheist Sam Harris, Harris was asked if the near universal acceptance of the idea of some kind of higher being or beings led him for even a moment to consider that God more likely existed. Harris bit the bullet and flat out said, no. Not even for a moment, Sam? Granted, the argument for popularity is logically fallacious in the strict sense, but typically when a whole bunch of people tell me the same thing, I at least stop and take the time to find out if it's true or not, even if I'm still skeptical. And I think the problem with the God question boils down to humanity's collective lack of expertise in all the ways the God question approaches us. Humans are just not good at metaphysics. It's outside of our domain. It's worth, it's worth believing if everyone, if everyone is telling me that it's raining outside, but if they tell me they know the secrets of the universe, it's worth being skeptical. Nevertheless, I'm going to present three lines of reasoning that engage some of these big questions. And if there's anything I would like anyone to walk away with here, it's that if you doubt uh, my ability to discern these matters and say, well, who are you to tell me that God doesn't exist and what do you know? Well, please, be consistent and hold all of humanity guilty of the same crime and reject popular opinion on the God question as at least undecided. So I have three arguments here. And my first argument, getting into that domain, is the category of non-physical things is incoherent and it's claimed that God is a non-physical entity. A so-called immaterial God has no height, width, depth, or location. Interestingly, this fits the exact same definition as something that doesn't exist and that can't exist. After we've robbed it of all of its existency things, we can't intelligibly maintain the label. Now, I could imagine the plausibility of there being other things that exist besides matter, but they're going to need to have some of that height, width, depth, and location stuff to qualify for the job, and those are explicitly the things that theologians claim immaterial objects and entities just can't have. Now, my second argument is somewhat related, and it's that a god who is outside of time or timeless is a god who cannot act. God is supposed to be operating on a temporal axis of change. Now, when I see a statue of a lion, and I'm reminded of C.S. Lewis's book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, I think to myself, hey, Aslan's doing a great impression of the real God. Now, and that's because things not on a timeline, by definition, are static objects. There's no getting around that. So how can a supermind be said to do anything that a mind is supposed to do if it's frozen solid? My third argument is a logical argument from evil against the existence of a popular kind of God that mainstream theology embraces. If God is all-powerful and all-knowing, then there's no excuse for any measure of evil. 
The Bible, for example, emphatically denies that humans should do evil so that good may result. That's Romans 3.8. Christians believe their worldview advocates the highest standards of moral perfection. They're supposed to come straight from this God's immutable essence. Now, I can understand if God doesn't have to honor his non-existent father and mother. I mean, that makes sense. But there's, but there's no logical reason these moral virtues shouldn't apply to God himself as well. By definition, this kind of God is complete in and of himself and doesn't have to do anything at all if he has free will. And they say he has free will. It's heresy to say that God actually needs, any, needs us or anything at all. So a God of perfect moral character would never need to violate this virtue and pollute reality with any kind of evil for any reason. So to sum up, the God hypothesis at some very fundamental conceptual levels is too not physical to even exist, too temporally static to be considered any more interactive than lawn ornaments, and way too negligent of our chaotic world to get the existential ribbon for most moral, men most moral entity ever. Thanks for your time. Hello, my name is Patrick Shawhan. I earned my Bachelor of Science in Philosophy here at Missouri State this past spring. I am now at Baptist Bible College and Graduate School studying for my Master's of Divinity. The question of this debate is, does God exist? And regrettably, this question is superfluous. This cannot be proven, nor can it be disproven. And most would even suggest that the proposition, does God exist, nor its proposition, God does not exist, nor its antonym, can even be demonstrated. And what I want to do is get to the heart of this issue and seek the answer of a far more interesting question. That is, is the belief in the existence of God epistemically justifiable? And one method used frequently to demonstrate and determine the answer of such a question is evidentialism. Evidentialism and its counterparts and synonyms, logical positivism, scientism, and narrow foundationalism. This is presumably the method being wielded by the atheists in this debate and is implied by the question, does God exist, requiring evidence for his existence. This method also suggests that belief in a proposition is justified only if it meets one of two conditions. First, the proposition is evident to the senses, can be understood a priori, apart from experience, or is incorrigible. And second, that proposition can be deduced from other propositions that are either evident to the senses, self-evident, or incorrigible. Now what the problem with this method is, is that it's inconsistent with much of what we commonly believe and it's self-defeating. It would be unjustifiable, for instance, according to this method, to believe that other people have minds, to believe that you've experienced a dream, or to believe in the continuity of existence apart from experience. Do you believe that the world ceases to exist when you fall asleep? That belief would be unjustifiable according to evidentialism. Also, it is unjustifiable to believe that evidentialism is true. The very proposition evidentialism is true is not deduced from the propositions of evidentialism, such as it is not self-evident, it is not evident to the senses, and it is not incorrigible. Thus, evidentialism is self-defeating. It cannot even meet its own criteria. So what are the alternatives to evidentialism? Well, there's total agnosticism, say that you cannot understand truth or there is no truth, or you can suggest a broad foundationalist method. The broad foundationalism suggests that any belief can be epistemically justified as long as it is part of a coherent worldview or ultimate picture of things. The epistemic worth of a proposition, moreover, is determined by its consistent presence in a coherent worldview. Thus, the epistemic worth of the proposition, God does not exist, in this context, can be analyzed by demonstrating the coherence or lack thereof of naturalism and the worth of the opposite proposition can be analyzed by looking into the coherence of supernaturalism. Now, I will seek in my presentation to demonstrate the incoherence of naturalism, and one of my counterparts, Scott, will seek to demonstrate the coherence of a particular brand of supernaturalism that we are both a part, that is Christianity. Problem with naturalism, if the universe exists in a closed system of random interactions between particles, that is, there is nothing outside the material nature of the world, then in what sense it is unclear how there can be any order or predictable patterns or laws in the universe. It is unclear. Moreover, if since there are patterns and laws in the universe, then all the behavior of all the particles should be understood as predetermined, that is determinism. 
including the behaviors of the particles that make up the mind of a person. Therefore, there can be no free will, only determinism. If you believe in, natu in naturalism, the ultimate logical conclusion is determinism. Moreover, this determinism is true, and there is no free will, and there is no sense in which humans can be said to have a self-consciousness. You cannot be self-conscious if you are only material. Moreover, if everything is random in a closed and purposeless system, then in what sense can humans have any inherent value? They cannot. Inherent value must be outside the system. Also, if there is no true self-consciousness and no sensible objective inherent value to humanity, then there is no meaning to existence, no reason for optimism, and definitely no ultimate need for ethics. And finally, if the reactions of particles in our brains determine everything, then both emotions and thoughts are meaningless. Feelings and beauty are both superfluous. They have no reference in reality. And reason cannot be trusted. If naturalism is true and all the particles in your brain are simply acting randomly, reason cannot be trusted. There is no reason to assume that the interactions of particles in your brain have any bearing on truth. They are random. This, what I've had to say, is from Nietzsche as well as many other philosophers. Naturalism was debunked in the late 1800s and is no longer really held by many popular philosophers or any scholarly philosopher. Hello. My name is Ryan Culbertson Fagri. Um, I'm going to do a talk today about faith and uh, what faith is, and then I'm going to talk about why it's incredibly stupid. In the next couple of days and in the next hour, you're going to hear a lot of people talking about reasons to believe or disbelieve in God. However, for some of you, uh, the evidence that we present won't be enough. The logic, the biology, the philosophy, everything we can muster won't be enough to change your opinions because some of you, unfortunately, have something called faith. I gotta define faith before I start talking about it. Um, faith is defined in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary first as the belief and trust in and loyalty to God and relatedly as the firm belief in something for which there is no proof. Now, it's important to note that when I say proof, Patrick specifically, I'm not saying uh, something like, we can prove that we don't exist as brains in jars. What I'm saying is, proof is a collection of ideas that logically compel somebody to believe something. And since I have no reason to believe that I'm a brain in a jar, I don't. So basically, faith, the definition can be boiled down to believing something without having any reason to believe it. Now, why faith, a concept often touted as a noble reason to believe in something, is one of the single dumbest um, single dumbest and most destructive ideas in history. It's extremely problematic. Uh, some of you are probably unconvinced and you're saying, what's the harm of a little wishful thinking? Well, the problem is, um, Martin, I agree with Martin, uh, religion is not the root of violence. It's not a cause of violence. I believe faith is a cause, cause of violence. Believing something without evidence is a cause of violence. Um, for example, every religious murder fest from the Spanish Inquisition, Inquisition to the Salem witch trials to 9-11 to the conflict between Israel and Palestine that's been going on forever. Um, this is all caused by people with irrational ideas. This is not a coincidence. Faith allows us to act on irrational animalistic instinct and gives us reason to accept ideas like racism, genocide, and worst of all, to me, abstinence only education. Now, do people have the right to believe whatever they want to believe? Sure. But just because you can believe something doesn't mean you should. Um, there's a really interesting problem that people with faith have, and that problem is when they're confronted with other people with faith who have harmful ideas, even if they're not directly committing harmful acts, they've got no leg to stand on logically. Uh, if, I, if I run into somebody that says black people are inferior to white people, or homosexuals should be stoned, or global warming is a myth, which I'm sure these people don't believe, clearly, but if I run into somebody who says that, I say, well, give me some evidence, and if you are right, if your evidence logically follows, then I'll agree with you. Um, they can never present evidence. When somebody with faith is asked to debunk these ideas, 
all they can say is you picked the wrong evidence to believe in uh, without, or, I'm sorry, you've picked the wrong idea to believe in without evidence. They can't say you believe in an idea without evidence. The problem is we get ideas like let's agree to disagree or I respect your opinions or your beliefs and while I want this to be a friendly debate clearly that gets us nowhere. That doesn't save lives, that does lives, that doesn't solve problems. What that does is it lets us off without actually discussing our ideas and being held logically accountable. I'm not going to analyze the evidence about whether God exists or does not exist for you. Uh, we're going to have a discussion about it and you're going to all determine, thank you, we're all going to determine whether or not we believe in God based on how logically sound the evidence is. But if you do your research and you find that uh, there is legitimate philosophical and physical evidence uh, to suggest that we shouldn't believe in a God, and you still decide to believe in a God because you have faith or because you already believe, if that's your position, I can't respect it. I do not respect that opinion. I cannot. I cannot respect that belief, and I will not agree to, dis to disagree with that. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Scott Admire, and I guess I should start off by saying I have faith. Um, good little intro there. Um, but my faith, my definition for faith is not at all um, what was just presented, um, having no reason to believe what I believe. Um, but before I get into that, I want to let you all know I was a religious studies major here. I um, graduated in spring last year, um, philosophy minor. And interestingly enough, uh, my worst class was public speaking. So, <laughs> um, in my classes, however, there was lots of deep thinking. Not a lot of persuasive words, not a lot of argumentation. Um, there was some debate, but um, this is not what I'm skilled at. What I'm skilled at is, is evaluating my beliefs. And the reason I was a religious studies major was because I came to this university with a Christian background and I asked a simple question, the very logical question. I believe strongly in what I believe. So does a Muslim across the world. How do I know I'm right and they're not? And so the question never really has been, does God exist for me? Because I mean, that is the question we're facing here. Um, but that, that has always been an emphatic yes um, for me. And it's because if all that was here is the natural world, um, it simply doesn't make sense. Um, Ecclesiastes 3.11. Uh, you guys are going to hate me for using the Bible. I know, that's okay. Um, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, God has set eternity in the, man's heart, in, the, in, the, in the hearts of men. And it's true. As I study religion, I look at cultures all around the world, and they all have a longing, a desire for eternity. They all have a longing, desire for something more, a greater power, something above just this world that we can touch, look at, see. And so, so what I really want to get across today, um, I'm no scientist. I know enough about things to know that I don't know very much. I'm not going to claim to be the smartest man here. Um, I met with Patrick this morning. I was just so thankful he was on my side because of all the big words he used. Um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I can't follow most of it. I had a philosophy minor. I still can't follow it. Um, what I want you all to see is the heart, my heart, and the heart of God that I believe does exist. And that doesn't mean you can cut me open and cut my heart in two and look at molecules and say, oh, I see his heart, which is all that they would argue. There's something more to this life. There's something more to why we're here. Um, and everyone desires, has this eternity in our hearts, this idea of eternal. And even even some atheists, even whether it be athletes, they have this idea of a legacy, maybe authors that write books. I will be here forever um, because I wrote these books. We all have this desire for eternity, even if it's not a theistic point. Um, so that's, that's um, really, really what I'm doing here. I'm not here to try to win. I just want to share with you my beliefs, why I believe. As far as faith goes, 
I, I, had, I do have faith. I have faith in a God, but it's not void of reason. It's not void of evidence. Um, I, we, we could talk about these evidences, um, but I believe the Bible, which is going to make some of you cringe. I understand this, but I do believe the Bible. It's hard for me to look at the prophecies in the Old Testament, seeing them fulfilled by Christ. And, and don't get me wrong, I look at a lot of these that people claim, and I'm just like, okay, they, oh, that's, that's kind of a stretch. You're really stretching it. But and just historical fact alone, and I'll keep it at historical fact alone, historians will say that, that there was a man named Jesus who was crucified. Historical fact, nearly 100% of scholars, and I mean scholars, not philosophers who try to reason out. I mean, historians will say this. And the fact that Isaiah was written 700 years before that and said a Messiah would come and hang on a tree, I just think we have a very, very lucky faith that Christ was not hit by a donkey cart because we would have a lot to explain. Um, there, there, are, there are these prophecies. There are difficulties. There are these reasons that I do believe. Um, they aren't scientific. And the last thing I will say is if all you base what you think on is scientific evidence, then it does not leave you to make the claim that God does not exist. Because God is outside of nature. And science is there to study nature, observe natural things. So once you make that claim, you're stepping out of the realm of science. Um, but I look forward to more discussion and questions. Thank you. I missed a very important thank you earlier. I didn't thank uh, the theist table for coming into uh, what amounts to almost literally a house of lions. So thank you. It's, it's very brave of you. We're happy to have you here. And at this point, you've gotten way more applause than the home team. It's tempting to say, when we look at this incredibly complex universe, that it's ordered that something had to do it. But when we examine this universe, what we see are natural processes that produce order all by themselves. For instance, if you have a large enough cloud of hydrogen, gravity is dependent on mass. If you have a large enough cloud of hydrogen such that it has enough mass to create enough gravity, it will begin to contract. Once that happens, it creates pressure in the middle of the cloud, which shoots up the temperature, which starts to fuse the hydrogen into helium. And once that happens, a very orderly and complex star will be born. Natural processes operating on inanimate objects, and you have something very highly complex like a star. And we've seen this pattern throughout history. The ancient Romans looked up at the stars and they saw order. Wanting an answer, as all human beings do, they said God must have done it. Later, along came a man named Sir Isaac Newton, who constructed laws, uh, models, as Dr. Stenger would say, to explain the phenomenon we observed as gravity. And it turned out that it wasn't God that ordered the stars. It was instead gravity. We didn't need God. But then the answer was that, well, God must be the author of gravity. That was fine until Einstein came along. And Einstein discovered that gravity is not the hand of God working on anything. It's simply uh, the bending of space-time. Anything that has mass will bend space-time and produce this phenomenon we called gravity. Now, for literally every discovery we've ever made, you can always say, well, God was the author of that point and the author of the following point. But we've never, ever seen any evidence that God had anything to do with anything. Every single thing we have ever explained, whether it's the diversity of life, star formation, flight, and our ability to defy gravity, has been explained through natural means, not God. Science, as Richard Carrier would say, is not finding God. It's finding natural explanations for everything. And as I'll argue in our rebuttal, even morality is subject to scientific, naturalistic explanation. And if you doubt this claim, there's a very easy test you can apply to yourself to double check this. Just in your head right now, try and think of any explanation for anything, we, for, anything for which we once had a religious explanation, but we now have a scientific explanation. If you're like me, this should not be difficult. 
But now try to think of something for which we once had a scientific explanation, but we now have a religious explanation. And this has been the pattern throughout our entire history. Religion has always been wrong once things have been explained. This is how it has always been. I don't see any reason to question what the odds of how this will continue to be. There are many things in this universe we do not understand. And if you're open-minded, you have to admit that. For instance, in the, Hu in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, there is a galaxy in the lower right-hand corner of those images which should not exist given our understanding of physics. It's too large. That's no reason to throw gravity out the window. It just means there's something we don't know. But in order to have a complete worldview, we have to fill in these metaphysical holes. We have to make good guesses on what we don't know. The only thing we can reasonably do with what we don't know is play the odds. Everything we've ever explained has required no appeal to God, none whatsoever. Everything we've ever explained has been found to be natural forces working on inanimate objects. The universe simply operates under a set of rules. How do you think all the rest are going to turn out? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank all the speakers for either finishing early or stopping quickly. All right, now, each team is going to have a chance to uh, speak to the issue or the rebuttal of their opponents for seven minutes. But first, I'm going to give each team a couple of minutes to uh, pool their heads and think about what they'd like to say. And then we will start with this side over here. All right, so two minutes. All right. All right, the uh, two minutes are up. So if we would, um, I, ask, I ask all speakers to realize you'll be staying in your seats and the speakers near the front of the table. I don't know how well they work, so you might have to lean forward at some point um, as we go along. And if people out there, if you can't hear, please wave your hands or flag or something so I can let the speakers know, please. All right, with that, you have seven minutes. Hey, we're on, all right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start by reiterating the problems of evidentialism. Um, it was pretty clear from uh, Mr. Ryan's presentation that he's an evidentialist, and I just wanted to go back over those problems. Uh, first of all, there is no evidence for the proposition, only, ev only propositions supported by evidence are justifiable. Thus, evidentialism in and of itself is a self-defeating claim. You cannot claim that only beliefs that are supported by evidence are justifiable. And once you make that step, then you have to understand, okay, what beliefs are justifiable? I am saying that I am saying that in a broad foundationalist model <laughs> the question period will come later. Now is their time. <laughs> I will have very much fun with your questions. So, just so because of that, they're going to get an extra minute. So if you'll please continue. Anyway, the, the outplaying of evidentialism basically doesn't work. It's self-defeating. Where we go from there is what we call broad foundationalism. Broad foundationalism is the suggestion that all beliefs, all propositions are basically justifiable if and only if the worldview of which they are a part is coherent. Science may or may not be among those worldviews. That's how we judge the epistemological reliability or justifiability or worthiness or whatever you want to say about any particular propositions. My presentation was with the purpose of demonstrating the problems of the naturalist and his worldview. Among those problems was the idea that reason is unacceptable, is, is irrational. There's no reason to trust reason if naturalism is true. Because of determinism, if the particles in your brain are predetermined to move in one particular direction or the other, there is no reason to believe that what you think or how those particles interact is in a reasonable manner or in any way applicable to reality. Moreover, I want to talk about the limits of human comprehension because if science is in fact only limited, then there has to be something beyond that or we fall into agnosticism. The failure of evidentialism leads us to believe that there's a limit in human comprehension. Moreover, infinity in and of itself is, as an idea is beyond the reach of human comprehension. When you look at infinity, even in mathematics, we cannot comprehend it, no computer can comprehend it. It is in and of itself contrary to the laws of logic, 
it can be self-contradictory and still infinity. As to science, science relies on a methodological naturalism. This is understood. It has to be so. But we have to understand that as an epistemology, it is thus subject to the problems of naturalism. It is also subject to the problem of an empirical basis, which I would challenge you to solve. And it's also subject to the problem of inductive reasoning, which I would also challenge you to solve. Go ahead. Just to add to that, um, I think science is based on faith. Uh, we, we, uh, we, just had, we just talked about how we don't know everything. We don't have an understanding of everything. Uh, JT talked about that, that there are still questions that we have not answered. So when a scientist makes a claim without an element of doubt, I think he's lost his credibility as a scientist. So to continue to talk about this evidential argument for faith, I think is dishonest. Uh, furthermore, just to, to go off of what he said, matter cannot be infinite. Uh, that, that's a fallacy in reason. So. For, for example, the, the idea that if somebody started to count, a man started to count, uh, and went on for infinity, the, the very nature of that says that he would have to have a starting point somewhere. Because the concept of infinity, let's say that he stopped today. Well, why couldn't he have just stopped yesterday, or the day before, or the day before that? It still would have been infinity. Infinity points to a starting point. Uh, I'm sorry, I just I misspoke there. The, the idea of the fact that we have a time period right now means that matter cannot be infinity. It can't be infinite. It had to start somewhere, which points to a point of creation, which goes to the argument of whether or not we can have an uncaused cause. I think that points directly to a creator. Um, there was also an, an idea that a God, I, I think Ben said this, a God who is outside of time cannot act. Um, I would say that uh, in the Christian view of God, that Jesus is a response to this. This is why in, in my reasoning, in my time that I took, I took a significant period of time, four years of my life studying religion at University of Virginia, to go through these questions. And I realized the only God I could worship was the God who entered into time, the God who drew near to me in the midst of my suffering. That is the answer to the suffering of people. That is the answer to the problem of evil and the problem of pain. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, well, I'd just like to address um, kind of JT, what he brought up about how every religious phenomenon has been explained with a natural cause. And as I said at the very end of my statement, that science is the study of natural things and that God is outside of nature. If there is a God, he is outside the realm of nature. So if we have a, a finding, say if someone studies my brain and can see what goes on whenever I pray to a God, cool. That just helps us understand scientifically the religious phenomenon that took place. Um, same, say if uh, there was a freak wind storm and the Red Sea parted, they say, see, it wasn't God, it was wind. No, that just explains how God used nature to work in that moment. Um, so natural reasoning does not exclude religious phenomenon. It just explains it through science, which is cool. Go for it. Study all you want. It's really cool to learn. But um, it doesn't disprove anything. And going back to this idea of science, because it's obviously the most important idea in the, this particular panel debate, um, as I said, it relies on methodological naturalism. But when we talk about the problems of science and the problems of knowing anything through science, we also have to solve the problem of causality. How do you prove that A caused B? And this is not a problem that has ever been solved in philosophy, and it's not a problem that is solved in science. It's the problem of inductive reasoning. If you can't show that A caused B, then you can't, you can't know anything about that particular relationship. It works. All right. All right. You're on. Okay. Uh, let me start off. Um, you say that I can't use logic um, as proof. 
um, because I can't prove that I can think logically. Well, I thought logically for a, a while, and if you'd like to play me in a game of chess, um, I can show you how logically I think. Right. Yes. Okay, yes. Uh -huh. Uh, we already discussed uh, proof. Proof is not unequivocal, this is what is, um, or this does not exist. Proof is simply a collection of ideas that logically compels somebody to believe in something. Uh, when we say proof, we're not talking about there's no other thing that could possibly be. Um, I'm going to give it over to JT because I know we have limited time. Uh, or, uh, uh, my turn? Yeah, knock yourself out. Uh, the big word, epistemology, I guess if nobody knew what that meant, is uh, it's your knowledge base, how you know what you know. It's the study of knowledge. Thought I would help out there if no one, no one said anything about that, did they? Um, I, I, I'd like to address a lot of Sean's comments because he got more into the philosophical, and I'd like to point out that I, I went straight for the philosophical. I went for the big metaphysical ideas for, you know, I, my, my third argument was actually about uh, coherency, that the theistic worldview, if we accept the basis of, you know, virtually everything, you know, all things mental and, you know, the laws of the universe is God, well, that leads to an internal, internally incoherent state of affairs, the, the, the logical problem of evil that I presented. And uh, that was addressed um, by saying that uh, Jesus is the answer to that. And I, I don't see how that, I, I don't see that uh, that confronts at all that, that we're, we're expected to have the highest moral standards and uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, if we see the good that we should do and don't do it, we're guilty. If we, you know, w there's no excuse for doing any evil that good may result, and yet those that morality comes directly from the immutable essence of God as the foundation. So why is God being inconsistent in that regard? Um, yeah, it's, obviously, there's there's lots of uh, issues to deal with in terms of, of minds and order and free will and human values and ethics and beauty and reason. And so there's a whole nest of, of, of huge philosophical debates that won't be covered in seven minutes. But uh, the, the, like what, pointing back to what I said, like these are all big, huge uh, things that people just aren't really good at, that figuring out. And so even after we're done going back and forth, we should probably walk away saying, well, maybe we don't really know what the basis of all these things are. And he brought up the problem of induction especially, but uh, I don't think that the induction insurance policy that theism is presenting, it, uh, it doesn't seem to solve the problem either. So why should we pick one worldview over the other? I mean, how do we know God's not going to change his mind? Like if you, if you play a video game, how do you know the level's not going to end? You don't know that. And if God is you know, supremely beyond anything we can comprehend, how can we predict whatever God has in store for anything? Or, you know, whether that's going to correlate with our religious sensibilities. We can't. You know, how, how do we know that his magic powers will work the same way tomorrow? Well, how, we can't know that either. So the problem of induction works both ways. And if it's not being solved by one worldview, why does it have to be solved by another worldview? Uh, in, in my opinion, we're left with practical agnosticism. I don't think science is making any particular claims to know, especially that the, law, the laws of physics are going to work the same way tomorrow. Well, if they don't, science will change. If a new law presents itself, if the laws reorganize themselves, we're just going to have to deal with that. And there's no inductive insurance policy that's going to protect you from that. So if you want to buy one, one worldview over the other, I don't think the problem is actually being solved. And we're all left in the same practical boat. Um, let's see. Uh, the origin of order, how can anything be orderly? Uh, in a naturalistic universe, well, why is God orderly? Why is God exempt from having to be explained? I mean, you can just say God's orderly, but, but well, why isn't the universe just orderly? Um, just pu pushing the problem back doesn't solve the problem. And expecting reason to, uh, so someone said specifically reason cannot be trusted. Well, I mean, that's a, a fallacy of composition. If, if our brains are just made of atoms, you know what? Computers are just made of atoms, and they do work fairly reliably. I mean, people are, have their laptops right there. Those are reliable inputs and outputs. They have structure. It's a, it's a specific special arrangement of a, pa of a pattern that reliably works. Maybe it won't work tomorrow, but everybody has to deal with that. There's, there's no exemption there. So we have you know, a relative proof of concept that atoms can work in, in meta patterns. And uh, so, like I said, that's a fallacy of composition, like straight up. Um, 
I think that that, oh, in terms of free will, uh, who here chooses their desires? Does anybody choose what, like if you, does anybody say, I don't desire chocolate ice cream, and then magically you make yourself want chocolate ice cream? If you don't desire something, you, can, you no one chooses their, okay. Uh, free will really means that no one is outside, outside the system coercing you. It's like the difference between your computer just operating on its own and a virus coming in to impede its normal operation function. So when we say, you're, you're infringing on my free will, you're not saying I have the magic ability to you know, desire things I don't actually desire. Whatever you desire is what you desire. I mean, there's no way to get around that. You say, well, I don't want that. Didn't you just say want? That's a desire, right? So like, you can try to back yourself out, but if you really analyze what you're doing, you're always desiring something in addition to what you're trying not to desire. Go ahead. Okay, one minute left. Here goes the quick version. Um, science is limited. Human cognition is limited. Well, yes, it is. We don't know everything. We're still working on it. But just because we admit that human cognition is limited doesn't give us the right to say because we don't know certain things, well, therefore, we can say we know certain things. It doesn't work that way. Um, we don't understand everything. Um, Martin says, talks about something about uh, science making claims uh, without any doubt whatsoever. That's not how science works. Science operates under doubt. Science is perpetually changing where it stands as we acquire new evidence. It's what science has so right that religion has so wrong. Um, matter cannot be infinite just because we can't comprehend it. I mean, even if we can't comprehend infinity, that doesn't mean that you know, it's, it's a, con it's a uh, non-realistic concept. Sure, matter could be infinite. Oh, crud, darn it. Um, Sorry, I took all your time. That's all right. Uh, reason cannot be trusted. Did he reason his way to that conclusion? Time's <laughs> up. Okay, eat, whoa. All right, each team is going to have two minutes to make a closing argument. Um, I'll give you one minute to pull your heads again and decide what the argument is going to be. And I should also apologize to the audience. I didn't explain the entire format before we got going. Um, what's going to follow after the closing arguments is each team is going to get to ask the other team three questions in alternating order, to which the other team can respond. And of course, the askers will get a chance to rebut. After that, we are going to let the audience ask each team or both teams questions, all right, and give them a chance to respond. So if you're waiting for the chance to ask questions of either team, You'll get your chance here in a little while, all right? All right, and closing arguments, two minutes, please. All right, just to be clear, we are suggesting that evidentialism, as required by naturalism, is a flawed method of epistemological justification. We are also suggesting that a belief, in, that a belief is epistemologically justified if it is part of a coherent worldview. We are suggesting that the, be the belief that God does not exist is part of a largely incoherent worldview, that is, naturalism. It's so incoherent with the idea of free will because it requires determinism. Every single particle is under the laws of physics and biology and everything. There is nothing outside the closed system, so it's determined. It's also incoherent with the idea that emotions and beauty have any attachment to reality. You have to be able to, you have to, be able to live with the idea that what you feel and what you think is pretty has nothing to do with what reality is. You also have to be able to live with the idea that reason is basically not reliable. Because, note that we are not saying, and we never said that reason is unreliable. We just said that naturalism requires the proposition that reason is unreliable, which makes it a self-defeating argument, because every thought in the mind is determined, and the particles do not have to act in a reasonable, logical way. Uh, we were compared to computers at one point, and I I'm wondering, uh, just thinking about an artist, Computers are open systems. They're not oh, yeah. closed systems. The universe is a closed system, so I don't understand where the comparison to computers even matters. Right. Computers are reliant upon the users. You're suggesting there is no user, so what is, what's the analogy? Right. I'm just, I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, artists who can't do anything but paint. They just have to paint, expressing this eternal that's in them. Uh, people, 
people who love other people despite dying? How do we explain that in terms of computers? How do we explain that in terms of naturalism? There's just no expl explanation for that. Thank you. Okay, on the universe being a closed system and uh, the first cause arguments. Do you know what the net energy in this whole universe is? It's actually zero. The universe is flat. And the reason it's zero is because the negative energy of gravity balances out the positive energy of everything else. You can test this by dropping a rock. As it hurtles towards a source of gravity, it picks up kinetic energy that is balanced once it hits the source of gravity. And a universe in which there is zero net energy could have arisen from, as you say, nothing. The uh, Nobel Prize winner, Frank Wilczek, uh, once said, when asked, why is there something rather than nothing, said it's simple. Nothing is unstable. Uh, which goes to the point of particles being random. If you take a region of space-time and remove every single thing from it, you have all of these uh, subatomic uh, particles bursting in and out of existence in appearance at random, annihilating each other. Just think about, try and define nothing. And if you, when you define nothing, you come up with properties, doesn't that make nothing a something? That is the nature of nothing in this universe. And in a universe with zero net energy, a fluctuation in space-time could have given us, could have very well given us uh, a universe like we see now. Now on art and meaning, uh, the Mona Lisa, is that a million smears, smears of paint or is it a painting? Well, it's both. It's just a million smears of paint. Uh, David is just a million ships with a hammer. But they're more than that. They're beautiful to us. It doesn't matter that they can be uh, augmented in our minds to anything more than that. Uh, morality. Um, I got nominated to take care of the scientific aspect of the debate on our ends, and morality does have a scientific aspect to it. When you watch piranhas feed, do they eat each other? When you watch uh, mother lions with their cubs, do they eat them? No, not at all. Um, Okay, I'll have to get into genetic morality later. To life, you sitting here is a meaning. Me talking is a meaning. We give our own lives meaning. Just because it's not cosmic, thank you. Okay, so what's going to follow next is each side gets to ask the other three questions. Um, and then the other team will get to... I will... Uh, I will cede to uh, the away team, so to speak, and they can ask a question of the home team. All right, can you demonstrate how reason is reliable within a closed system that is not a, like a computer, which is an open system, a closed system of an unauthored universe? In other words, how can we know that the reactions of particles in our brains work in a logical and epistemologically reliable way? And if we can't demonstrate this, isn't naturalism basically self-defeating? Um, I think we have no reason not to believe that uh, we act logically. Like I said, um, if we play a game of chess, then we're both going to be thinking logically. Um, or we're both going to agree on certain concepts. Now, is it possible that uh, our logic is flawed? Is it possible that we're just brains in a jar? Whatever. Sure, it's possible, but we have no reason to believe that. So until we have reason to believe that we are unreasonable creatures in the face of all this evidence that we are reasonable, um, at least to a certain extent, I see no reason uh, to surmise that. Uh, yeah, just not, the computer analogy was only a very specific, focused analogy that says that matter can be arranged in ways that work in terms of logical procedures and what we would recognize as logical procedures. So if, if you can program a computer to perform logical procedures, a setting aside the fact of a human component, that shows atoms in and of themselves can be specially arranged to do the task. Now, what we have to do is push this back to a creation evolution debate, and I didn't hear any arguments against evolution, so if you believe evolution can produce a reliable spleen and a reliable stomach and, you know, all of those things working together, why can't it produce a brain that can, you know, justifiably do logical operations? And from a scientific perspective, um, science on naturalism works upon only one assumption, that the universe operates under a set of rules. And we can test this, and it works. It works so well, we're able to throw satellites to the edge of the solar system. We're able to defy gravity with airplanes. At this point, it stops being something we merely have faith in and something that becomes reasonable to believe. Um, you didn't answer the question. Uh, the question 
is how is it that reason can be reliable in a naturalistic, deterministic format, not is reason reliable? I recognize your points, that we have technology, we have these seeming rules that make sense that reason, reason is reliable, but it does not make sense that reason would be reliable if naturalism and determinism are true. I would, I would say on, on, on top of that with the evolution argument, um, I think uh, moral law and objective moral law is a response to that. Also the uncaused cause idea of how, how the universe began would be two responses to that. Gentlemen, you may ask a question. Okay, Patrick, um, you said that to take my perspective, you must be able to live with the ideas of no universal morality and of determinism, the idea that our actions are predetermined, right? Basically. Basically. Okay. Uh, this confuses me because it seems that what you're saying is you think that um, we should believe that which um, is pleasant over that which makes sense. Do you believe that we should believe that which makes sense or that which is pleasant? Um, there's a flaw in your question. Um, we choose worldviews based on coherence. That is what I believe. Okay. And if, you, if you're saying it makes sense, if that's synonymous with coherence, then I would agree with you that we, we choose what makes sense, what's coherent to you. But coherence can be tested on what you see, what you feel, the things that we observe and the things that we experience internally as well as ex externally, the things that we experience objectively as well as subjectively. So, does that make sense? Uh, kind of. You're a beast. <laughs> I don't really have a counter argument to that. Uh, I can make the close if yeah, you go can. ahead. If you'd yeah. like to address that. Um, okay. Yeah. One of the examples you used earlier, Patrick, was you know, how do we know that we're thinking or that someone else is thinking? And uh, the nature of knowledge is not an absolute nature. Uh, most of us probably don't believe that leprechauns exist. Now, that doesn't mean that sometime in the future we won't turn over a rock on some planet or our own planet and find a leprechaun. Um, if we're open-minded, we have to admit this possibility. So we can't be absolutely certain there are no leprechauns. We can just be reasonably certain. And so... Uh, for him to say, you know, you can't be sure of this, well, no, if you're open-minded, you can't be absolutely sure. But beliefs are, uh, are uh, produced in our mind in terms of probability. We can be as certain as we can be about certain things, and whether or not reason is reliable is certainly uh, on that level. Oh, I'm good. Yeah, we're good. Okay. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, you may ask your next question. Um, if there is no objective morality, and this is uh, based on what JT was saying, mm -hmm. then isn't all morality simply subjective? How can you explain, for example, how can you explain social justice movements and the compassion that someone would feel for a suffering human being across the world? How does this have anything to do with bears and piranhas? Okay, I can do that. Um, there are several facts about biology or even philosophy that get us to a naturalistic morality. Uh, for instance, when the great apes moved into the trees, they had to develop better depth perception to avoid falling out of the trees. This is tied to a gene called, and I shit you not, Sonic Hedgehog. <laughs> I'm not lying, look it up. But this comes tied to another gene which decreases our field of vision, okay? This made our ancestors victim to predatory birds unless they banded together. Now, your, neuro your neurochemistry determines your disposition, and if you doubt this, try imbibing a great amount of alcohol or smoking a tremendous amount of marijuana. Um, that changes how agreeable you are, how aggressive you are, and it's all tied to your neurochemistry. Now, if you had a group that survived predatory birds because their neurochemistry uh, better supported working together, they would survive to reproduce. That would create a genetic disposition to be empathic in us. And that's really where the objective morality, can, well, I don't think there's objective morality. Uh, but the thing is, if we have empathy, which we do, we feel others' pain, we generally feel others' happiness. And when people don't do that, we consider them dangerous and tend to remove them from our herd. We tend to jettison them from society. Um, that is morality. We're all trying to be happy. And when we see people doing something that's in contra to the, to the um, interest of our group, we kick them out. This is why we create rules like don't steal, don't kill. It's also why 
they're not uh, clear across the board. Not every culture has the same morality because there is no objective morality. We're just doing our best to construct rules by which to live. So, so if this is just groupthink, which is what you're saying, you know, if it's just all uh, morality is constructed by groupthink, why, why is it that people in America or in, in another country would see somebody else in another country and go over there and do ministries of compassion? Where does this social justice thing come from? I mean, why, and why would people commend them for that? If, because that has nothing to do with the survival of your group. And, and rather that has to do with this compassion and this feeling of love for your common human being. And you would, you would probably agree with me, this, this is a good thing to do, right? It's a good thing to go across the ocean and take care of, of somebody in an African country, even though, or a, a Latin American country, even though that has nothing to do with the good, goodness of your group, the survival of your group, the survival of your country, and yet people do this all the time. And uh, just to add, uh, what, you, what you claimed had a lot to do with self-preservation. Um, if you grant us 20 seconds, I have an answer. <laughs> if you grant me 10. Uh, we have to move on. Okay. <laughs> unless, unless both sides want another minute to go No, no, we need to get to audience time. questions. You're right. Okay. All right. Do we have? Both teams want to waive the rules for a little bit here. Is there one more? Do we have one more question? Yeah. You have one more question each. Uh, I, yeah, well, actually, don't you get two? One more from you and then one more each. Yeah. So I think we're just at one more piece. Right. No, no, I, I've got the closing question, that's right. No, you get, you, this team has two more questions to go, this team has one more question, okay. I believe. Yes. All right, to you guys. You Thanks for confusing me, JT. I do what I can, sir. You've got the PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Which means I'm easier to confuse. <laughs> Who's going? Knock yourself out. Okay. Uh, this question is addressed to anyone who wants to answer it. Um, we talk a lot about the coherency of a worldview, but, uh, and you mentioned uh, that matter cannot be eternal or infinite. And you, you mentioned that if you started to do something, you would never get to an infinity. Um, the problem with that is, in terms of the coherency of the Christian worldview, is that uh, if God knows, or here's my question, if God knows everything, and you as a Christian believe in eternal life, in a new heavens and a new earth, after a physical resurrection, at which point in time does God not know about? Or which point in time in the future, in your eternal life, does God not know about? Just to be clear, the, the point of talking about um, etern eternality and the infinity of matter and such was to demonstrate the limit of human comprehension. That is infinity. I am suggesting that human reason is reliable in finite things, just the same way Newtonian physics is reliable in finite things. Once you get to the level of the atomic, Newtonian physics is no longer applicable. Once you get to the level of the planetary, Newtonian physics doesn't work anymore. Human reason is the same way. Once you get to the infinite, human reason doesn't work. And I can demonstrate this. If you take a set, an infinite set of numbers, let's take whole numbers for example, for instance, one, two, three, four, five, six, on to infinity. That is an infinite set of numbers. Take another infinite set of numbers. You've got all of the real numbers. 1.1, 1.12, 1.1234567. There are all there is an infinite number of numbers between every whole number, such that infinity must be infinitely greater than itself, demonstrating that it sets aside at least the law of non-contradiction. It sets aside the law of what? Non-contradiction. Okay. Um, I was talking in terms of the coherency of the Christian worldview, so I mean... I, I was just saying that if, if, I mean, do you agree that a physical infinity in terms of like the past or the future is possible, is logically possible? Whether it's true or not is another question, but is it logically possible that there could be an infinite past or an infinite future? Yes, and, and, and the point of demonstrating that infinity is beyond the realm of human comprehension is to say that if God is both infinitely intelligent and infinitely powerful, then the two can be seemingly contradictory, but both be true, because infinite, infinity is beyond the law of non-contradiction. Okay. okay, I wasn't arguing anything about that, so... Okay. Um, actually, I think there's a factual uh, inaccuracy there that we can't comprehend these types of infinities. We can. Math deals with closed infinity, which is the type you were talking about in between every number, and open infinity, which uh, deals with infinity on the whole. And we do comprehend this. We just absolutely do. Um, so that's all I've got on that one. 
Okay, uh, we still got time. Um, who here understands the Pythagorean theorem? Okay, we got, <laughs> we got a, thanks, Micah. Okay, the, math the Pythagorean theorem is used to find uh, the distance of a hypotenuse of a triangle, of a right triangle, where A and B are two sides and C is the hypotenuse. And it's A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Some of us don't understand this. Now, if somebody who didn't understand this was to come up to me and say, we don't understand this, I would say, well, some of us do. Some of us deal with this every day. Some of, some of us understand what's going on. Just because um, you do not understand infinity doesn't mean that some people don't understand the concept of infinity. Um, I'm done. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Uh, they want to waive their question to get the audience questions. Yes or no? It's up to you. All right. We will go with one more question each then. Unless you wish to waive yours afterwards, and then we'll go to audience questions. All right. Well, this might be raised by some member in the audience anyway. But um, I learned uh, very early on in my minor philosophy career that it's improper and invalid to judge a philosophy based on its abuse. Um, just if I were to judge science, uh, say, well, I think science kills people because someone, say, the Holocaust or an atom bomb, used science to destroy people. So I think science always kills people. Um, I see similar claims made um, by faith and religion, uh, especially from Ryan saying that faith causes so much violence, when I would say the abuse of faith causes violence. The abuse of, if you read the biblical New Testament, which is where we live in today, um, and you come across killing people, that is an abuse. So the question is, are you judging of faith based on its abuse, and is that a logical thing to do? Okay, um, I believe that we should stress test every philosophy that is put in front of us. Uh, I certainly believe that. Uh, faith, I'm not saying faith causes violence, because clearly you three are very faithful young men who are not, uh, to my knowledge, violent. None of you are serial killers. What I'm saying is <laughs> I'm saying that faith allows crazy, violent thinking. What I'm saying is that uh, for somebody like me, um, let's say I'm presented with the idea that homosexuals are bad people. I'm going to say, well, I know some homosexuals, and none of them seem to, to be bad people to me. So I'm going <laughs> to so I'm going to say uh, I disagree uh, with that. I disagree with your logic, um, and I I found an exception. Whereas somebody with faith, um, if somebody says, I think homosexuals are bad people because my old book says so, um, somebody with faith can only say, well, I interpret the old book differently. They can't say, why do you trust an old book written thousands of years ago that seems to contain no truth? Yeah, I, I think to build off that, I, if faith as a method is, is prone to all sorts of errors. It's a wild card in, in the equation that we can't, you know, if, if there's two conflicting faiths, well, we have to have some way to deduce between them. And if you, if you really, really think that it's God's opinion that your faith is right, somebody else does. I mean, that's not, it, it's not a, a good fulcrum for getting all sorts of people with different perspectives to work together in terms of, you know, solidarity and, you know, making the world a better place, so. Okay, we have one minute. All right, um, well, I would just say, as far as two people with differing faiths, um, that's when you start looking at the evidence. Okay, well, why do you say you believe this, and why do I say I believe this, just like you guys promote so often? And I can tell you this, I, I don't get mad at you guys, I don't get mad at people that don't believe in Christ, but I get ticked and just pissed off at Christians a lot of my life. <laughs> you too? Uh, amen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, me too, because I see so many people twist what is so clearly presented in the Bible. I mean, read First John, and you will see that the Christian walk is not just about love, it is love, how we carry out love for people. It says, this is how we know what love, it, love is. Christ died for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Um, so there he says, how we're supposed to treat people is to put them above us. And for someone to take that and think that I'm better than someone else, or that I'm more important than someone else, is a total abuse of it, and it ticks me off. But you have to look at, well, it's just not, that's just not the only thing in the Bible. Oh, sorry, see, this is a question. No, no, no. no. Oh, my bad. Sorry. Uh, oh, I'm just 
I mean, if anyone want to talk about what these other things in the Bible are, please talk to me. I've spent the last four years of my life studying this stuff, so I uh, love talking about it. Okay, Sorry thank to interrupt you very much. Um, did you want to ask another question? Yeah, I'll ask a question. Why not? Okay. I like questions. Um, okay. Um, if people went around stealing from everybody else, killing at whim, um, murdering our neighbors, raping their pets, and stealing their pornography, <laughs> would life suck if, we, if those things happened? Two minutes. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which um, I would argue right now for the majority um, life is unpleasant if life would suck with that, without those more rules what more motivation do we need to, to make them up um, good question <laughs> because <laughs> I do what I can if you're suggesting that morality can be subjective, then each individual can create their own morality. And I would argue that the problems in this world, much along the lines of Nietzsche, and the Nietzsche brings out the logical conclusion of naturalism, and, and it's basically nihilism. You, you create your own reality, um, you create your own morality, and the will to power is ultimately what deals out the damage is ultimately what does violence. And if you want to go the naturalist route, then what you've got is the will to power. And that's what causes violence. And people will use religion or whatever they can get their hands on to get power. If your existence is solely about you and only about what you can get, then it only makes sense that you're going to make yourself as powerful as you can, the will to power. You can use violence and justify violence by the will to power. OK. Um, One minute. Now remember what I said earlier about your disposition uh, being, result, being the cause of your empathy. We do have empathy, and that's what answers Martin's question earlier. Why would you go across the world to help somebody else? Well, because when I see someone suffering, I suffer to an extent. I have all the motivation I need because it'll help me feel good. Yes, that's very selfish, but that's the way it is, pure and simple. I've had things stolen from me before, so I know what it feels like to have something stolen from me. So if I were to steal, I would necessarily become the type of person I would hate, and I would hate myself. This would make it very hard to sleep at night. <laughs> Which is exactly what I talk about uh, with morality being subjective. We have empathy. And if morality is subjective, it's not just about lust for power. It's about being happy in our own skins. That's why even atheists will give to charity. That's why atheists will do good things. Which is why when I ask if life would suck without making up moral laws, even if we just made them up, that's all the motivation we need. We shouldn't need anything else. Yeah, things didn't turn out so well for Hitler and Stalin. And <laughs> okay.